Tennessee lawmakers passed the first school gun safety program in the country. Plus, the Biden administration cast a shadow over used gun sales. All this and more on the Reload News Update. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. Uh, founder of TheReload.com, where you can head on over and sign up for a free newsletter to stay up to date on all things happening on guns in America. And speaking of the newsletter, we're going to start with our first link of the day. Uh, this one comes to us from NBC News about a fairly harrowing tale of a defensive right? gun use in <laughs> Idaho, where an 85-year-old woman uh, successfully fended, defended herself from an armed burglar uh, and was actually wounded in the encounter and survived for about 10 hours while being wounded um, and then went to the hospital and ended up being okay. So it's just a pretty crazy tale of a defensive gun use. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of the most uh, remarkable ones that I've heard in, in a while. And, and, you know, this is something that we, we follow fairly closely at the reload. And um, honestly, we should write more about defensive gun uses because they, they happen, um, you know, every, every day you get stories like this, but this one is really really out there's like a movie you know so uh, this uh man in a ski mask breaks into this woman's home uh with a gun and a flashlight and hit, handcuffs her to a chair while he tries to uh, go around her house and steal her stuff right and uh at one point he goes into another room to look for more valuables and uh, you know, all this, this whole time he's, he's violent and he's trying to he hit her, uh, just begin with, this is an old woman too. It's a four year old woman. It's not, you know, it's a particularly despicable thing to do obviously, but, uh, but also clear threat to her life. Um, even beyond just the fact that he broke in armed, right. That, that alone is, uh, obviously cause for serious concern, but he's also hitting her. He's threatening her. He goes in another room. She goes and gets her 357 Magnum revolver that she apparently kept, at least according to NBC News, kept under her pillow. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, it grabbed that, dragged the chair over while still handcuffed to it, grabbed the gun. And then, uh, perhaps smartly, right? Uh, maybe she watches active self protection, which by the way, if you guys don't know uh, anyone watching our podcast, I, do a podcast with active self-protection as well. You guys, you should check out both their YouTube channel and that podcast if you haven't before, but uh, you know, they give self-defense advice, real world uh, video reviews of actual defensive gun use. Um, and, and one of the things they tell you is that, you know, when you're armed and you're, you're always going to be working from the ambush because the bad guy is going to have that advantage. They're going to be the ones who spring the ambush. And so you have to wait your turn to, uh, to uh, draw and use your firearm. If you, if you try to draw while, uh, on, from the drop where someone's got a gun pointed at you, you're not likely to survive that. And so she smartly waited until, um, there was a point where she had an opportunity and, and also he had become even more threatening by then. Uh, and she had hidden the gun and she pulled it out and, and shot him. And they actually got into it like a gunfight. Uh, at that point. Right. And she, he fired several shots back at her with his nine millimeter and she, she was shot several times. Right. Yeah. According to the news report about four or five times uh, she was hit and she was successful. She hit him as well. And uh, yeah. eventually fatally. Um, but she was there uh, according to the report. So she had lived in the house with her disabled son who evidently mm -hmm. was not around for the actual shooting encounter. And so she laid there wounded handcuffed to this chair for several hours I think 10 hours is what they said in the news story Yeah, until yeah. her son found her and they were finally able to get medical attention. So just, and she survived. She, she went to the hospital and has already been released from the hospital. Yeah. So an incredibly tough, uh, 84 year old woman to not only survive this ordeal, but fight to protect herself and her son, uh, successfully, and then survive multiple gunshot wounds. Um, that's remarkable, right? That is a remarkable story of, uh, human survival, the the instinct to to make it through a horrible situation like that, and um, you know, kudos to her. It's uh, incredible. 
Absolutely. And just goes to show that, you know, sometimes these, these a reason why self-defense is the number one reason people say they own firearms and mm -hmm. stuff like this, though, though rare, like you said, this one seems almost movie like because of how outlandish it is, but yeah. stuff like this a happens. Of, a lot of like stuff you'd see in the movies or the old gun store talk in this, you know, she had a people say, get a revolver because it's simple. You load it. And, you know, uh, I feel like if you, a lot of gun store people who hang out at gun stores would give you that kind of uh old advice about you know if you're looking for a gun for an 84 year old woman you might just get a revolver so just load it and leave it alone and it'll work there's not there's no uh complications like you might have with a semi -auto. this is like there's a very common <laughs> argument that you hear uh i think people people often view that as kind of a fuddler thing um but I mean, it's not without merit. And yeah, she slept with it under her bed or under a pillow, suppose, according to NBC News. I don't know how practical that is, but uh, maybe, you know, just a wild story. And then, yeah, a whole gunfight and guy showed up with handcuffs. And I mean, it's it's wild. Um, but I'm obviously we're glad that she came out on top of that situation. Uh, always unfortunate with anyone. Um it gets into a life or death situation, uh, but I'm glad that she was the one who, who made it out. Certainly. Um, the next story we want to talk about comes to us from the Associated Press. Uh, it's sort of an interesting thing that happened in Washington State this week where a state court actually struck down their ban on uh, ammunition magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds as unconstitutional. Uh, and then within about 90 minutes, their attorney general was able to appeal that to the state Supreme Court and get a stay put on it. So it's back in effect after just a very brief window. Yeah. Um, and then it's well, that, that, sort I mean, of, that's remarkable by itself, right? I right. Mean, there's an extra little bit to this that's even uh, I don't know, uh, sort of a troll aspect that we'll get into. But but um, I mean, yeah, the coordination on that, that, uh, you know, I think the it's hard to imagine the Supreme Court. I mean, you know, maybe Washington operates differently than a lot of other courts. Uh, I've never heard of anything like this before, but it sure sounds like the Supreme Court knew what was going to happen and was sitting around waiting for a stay to come so they could issue it. Uh, which, yeah, that's remarkable. I mean, this is this you hear this a lot in the Ninth Circuit. Now, this is a state court, so it's not federal court. Um, but these, these are the kind of complaints you hear a lot from gun rights advocates out, out on the West Coast, you know, Washington, Oregon, Cal California, or, uh, you know, also Hawaii, I guess, is, is added in there as well, but uh, in the Ninth Circuit. But, you know, the sort of thing where even if you win it in court, your wins are almost immediately undone by the next the next court up. And uh, that's that's something we've heard. Uh, gun rights litigators out there complain about for years. And this is, I think, maybe the most egregious example of that uh, maybe I've ever heard uh, outside of perhaps what the Fourth Circuit did. You know, we had uh, Mark Smith, the uh, gun rights uh, lawyer on or advocate commentator a little while back, talk about the Fourth Circuit out here. This is a federal case in the, their assault weapons ban case, their AR, the Maryland AR-15 ban case where the the circuit there like didn't even let the uh lower court issue a ruling and played tricks to make sure that didn't happen um so you know it, it's something that there's not something you see very often and i think this is maybe one of the more egregious examples of this kind of court manipulation going on um you know not nothing illegal or anything like that just right. kind of transparent <laughs> i guess in the motivations of, yeah. of the courts involved, perhaps. Yeah. Certainly one of the quickest turnarounds I've, you know, seen in, in following these gun cases. But there was, you know, even for that limited window, there was at least some practical effect for uh, gun owners in the state. Uh, I saw a separate local news report about one particular gun store owner in Kelso, Washington. I believe that's in eastern, Wa or yeah, eastern Washington. Uh, in that 90 minute window, he sold hundreds of quote unquote, large capacity magazines, which as we said, it, it, they define as capable of holding more than 10 rounds. So in that brief window where it was struck down, he, he took full advantage. So, <laughs> yeah. So there, there, that goes the other way too, right? Like the gun right. rights advocates and gun gun owners out there 
understand what the state of play is in the court system there. And they probably knew well that a stay was going to come at some point. And so, yeah, the very, very reminiscent of Freedom Week in California when their right. magazine ban was uh, was found unconstitutional by a lower court. Uh, there was about a week before a stay got issued in that case, which is maybe a little bit closer to what you might expect. A couple days, a week before a higher court is going to issue a, a stay on the lower court. If that's in the case where the lower court doesn't issue a stay themselves, which is something that's routine, but doesn't always happen. And so, yeah, uh, that's the freedom week is what you might expect more, not freedom uh, 90 minutes or whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think the uh, people who live out there, uh, I had a full understanding of what, what was going to happen next and that it would probably happen quickly. So, um, yeah, pr pretty interesting to see, uh, and pretty remarkably transparent on the part of this, maybe this, the state Supreme court, uh, you know, who knows, maybe they'll go the other way on the merits, but, um, usually if they're going to undo something, a lower court did that fast, you know, toss out a stay that quickly, uh, it's probably because they're going to, uh, disagree with that lower court ultimately, but it's not a guarantee. We'll see what happens. Certainly. We'll stay on top of it. Um, and then the last link we want to talk about from the newsletter today comes to us from the free press uh, by Maddie Friedman, who uh, this is a, a very interesting piece that kind of dovetails nicely with some of the coverage we've done in the past about the rise of Israelis uh, getting armed in response to the October 7th massacres last year and the Israeli government's subsequent a uh, slight loosening of their gun laws to allow for more civilians to get armed or at least get handguns. And Maddie here talks about his experience uh, getting a Glock in Israel and just sort of talking about the differences and his sort of conflicted feelings about this and the differences in gun culture between Israeli gun culture and American gun culture. And it's a, mm. it turns out to be a fascinating piece. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a really good piece and maybe somebody we should have on the show. Uh, you know, people leave a comment or let us know if you think we should, we should have uh, Matt, Matty on to just to examine his his worldview and, and some of these differences that you see between, I guess, Israeli gun culture and American gun culture, uh, even, uh, you know, American Jewish gun culture, which is, I think, much closer to just general American gun culture than it is to Israeli gun culture. Because, you know, how the way he describes it in the piece, you know, he, he talks about the, his Glock being like a like a a monument to um, how bad things have gotten there more than, uh, you know, this, this uh, sort of tool of defense that, that people appreciate or, or, or that he has reverence for when it's, it's much more about, he wishes he didn't have to do it, have a gun at all. Right. And he, he talks a lot about Israeli gun, Israelis like view of firearms ownership. Um, it's, it's really fascinating and it's still fascinating to see that perspective, even in the wake of October 7th. Uh, and even when he, he goes into discussing uh, like their, their gun laws are still fairly strict compared to uh, American gun laws. And we've, we've talked about this. We've, we, you know, we've covered this topic quite a lot in the past, both by speaking to Israeli officials about what's going on there and how things work in Israel and also talking about um, the American Jewish community and their reaction to October 7th and, and some of the protests that followed in the United States and the desire to, to become armed um, here. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting bits is that in Israel, you still basically can only have a handgun. Now they don't, they don't have, they have a different approach to it for carry, like if you own a gun, you're kind of more expected to carry the gun um, as a kind of layer of of community defense, I guess is, is how you would put it. So they they don't have the same sort of dichotomy between gun handgun ownership and handgun carry that we do here in the United States, where it's there's really kind of two separate things. You have to go through a whole nother process to get the ability to carry a gun. Uh, it's not really like that in Israel, but at the same time, you can only get a handgun as a civilian. And, uh, you know, it's, it's much more difficult to get a rifle, uh, or spe especially something like, you know, an AR-15 or, or I guess an Israeli Tavor or something like that. Um, 
And, you know, it still strikes me as uh, interesting that if your concern is an October 7th style a- attack where it's like an armed, organized, um, vicious, you know, terror attack by, by multiple people, um, you know, a handgun is not the option I think a lot of people in the United States would, would look to for trying to defend against something like that. Um, it's basically just not sufficient for, for that sort of role. Um, so it's kind of interesting in that way too. I mean, there's just a lot of differences that you see, I think, between like the American perspective on why, like, especially like the American gun owning community. Obviously, there's plenty of people in America who also don't think people should own guns or don't own guns themselves or what have you. There's a, there's a live debate here, certainly, right, over the role of firearms in society. But uh, among those who do own guns, I think that it's a very different point of view um, and, and ethos than what he describes in that piece for, for Israelis. And I'm sure there are also Israelis that take a more American view of, of gun ownership. Um, but it's just, it's just interesting to look and, and see um, in a, in a country where people are under threat of, of violence like that um, fairly regularly and that it could occur to, you know, basically terror attacks could happen anywhere in the country at any time. Um, you know, not that it's a every single day occurrence, but you, you get the point. Like that's, that's the, the concern level. And I think a lot of Americans, gun owners would view that as like something where they would expect a lot more people to want firearms and to, to value them uh, the same way that, that we do here. And it's, it's not quite the, the same perspective. And it's, it's an interesting thing. But uh, maybe something we should un- unpack more with with him because he can give, you know, the the, the Israeli gun owning perspective, uh, obviously better than you or I could. Right. Yeah, certainly. No, I think that would be very interesting. Like you said, he, <clears throat> he sort of approaches this shift in, in tolerance for gun ownership and gun carry among civilians with a very solemn perspective. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's like it's, a necessary yeah. evil uh, right. perspective to him, whereas a lot of American gun owners would view uh, guns and the, the ability to own them as a civilian, as a, as a positive, as a, as a positive good, like a, in and of itself is a positive thing. And, and, you know, there's different founding cultures. I, I talk about this a lot. Um, whenever, like I do the, this week's, by the way, this week's podcast, we'll, I'll preview it later, but the interview podcast deals with the journalism class that I teach and, we get a lot of international students in there. And one of the things I try to teach them about American view of firearms is that, you know, it, it comes in large part from our founding tradition where we were founded at, uh, as the result of an armed revolution. And so, um, uh, where the, the myth, the mythos or the view or the, the history of it, uh, or a combination of those things is that, you know, you had an armed civilian population throw off a tyrannical government. And that's what plays into how part of how Americans view guns. You also have like rugged individualism. You have all these things that are tied up in the American identity that where guns play a significant role. And I guess in Israel, uh, at least, at least, uh, according to Maddie, it wasn't not, it's not the same, um, sort of uh, view of things. There isn't that same kind of connection historically. Certainly. Uh, listeners should definitely go check out that piece and, and read it and stay tuned because hopefully we'll uh, maybe have him on the podcast in a, yeah. in a future episode. I'll reach out to him. Um, getting into the some of our stories and the big story of the week comes to us from the Biden administration because they officially announced their finalized rule of the um, engaged in a business rule, basically determining when someone needs to have a federal firearms license when they're selling used firearms. Um, and as you sort of pointed out in your reporting and your analysis on this, uh, it still leaves a few questions because it doesn't seem like a ton is going to change. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, anyone who read the analysis piece for members, you probably tell them I'm kind of of two minds on this. Uh, you know, certainly if you go and read coverage of it, uh, the announcement or you listen to the attorney general or the president, they are 
arguing it's a very big deal. And you might even see, you know, gun rights groups agreeing with that take that it's, but there's kind of an incentive, I think, <laughs> on either side to make this out to be a much bigger thing than maybe it, it is. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say it's, it, it's, it's not significant. Um, but the main issue I have is a lot of the things that are in this rule, and look, it's a 400, I think there's like 450 pages. So I haven't read every single page, but as far as I could tell, reading through the actual final rule section, it's very similar to the proposed rule that we wrote about back when it was first um, announced in August of last year. And a lot of the factors that they talk about for determining whether or not somebody is engaged in the business and needs, therefore, to get a federal firearms license in order to sell firearms legally. Uh, they're pretty similar to stuff that the ATF's been saying for years, right? Um, you know, they're, they're stuff like repetitive sales, um, in a, especially in a short period of time, selling, buying new guns and reselling them you know, within 30 days, uh, doing it primarily to make a profit, uh, renting tables at a gun show, advertising that you sell guns, uh, you know, either through online ads or with business cards or something, telling people that you buy and sell guns and can be a source of guns for them. You know, the, there's a lot of things like that, um, which frankly are, are things that they've, said forever and and honestly that have come out of a long history of court rulings on this fact uh you know now it uh, at the same time it, it it is it does seem fairly clearly designed like a lot of atf st stuff like a lot of what the atf does because we've, we've talked about this uh significantly with the pistol brace rule for instance they have some fairly vague standards in the pistol brace rule that makes it unclear whether your pistol braced gun is legal or not. Uh, now I think with the pistol brace, it kind of, they got to the point where it was almost everything that has a pistol brace is, is considered an SBR by the ATF. And so you'd need to register and all that to keep it legal. Um, in this case, it's a little more, uh, it's a similar idea where like repetitive sales. Well, how many sales, qualifies you as needing a license well they won't say right it could be as few as one uh it could even be none as long as you express the intent to uh engage in in you know the business of dealing firearms right you don't have to actually go through with the sale is one of the things that's uh, i would say is actually a bit new but it sounds like something for sting operations uh right if that makes sense like they can get somebody to tell them that they're going get an undercover agent they tell you you tell them you're going to start dealing them guns they don't you don't have to actually go through the sales i guess is what they're trying to get at. but you know as few as one or two guns sold you might need a license uh under under this rule well that's something they've been saying for a while uh at least since 2016 that was a big push that the obama administration made right at the end of his term and the main difference here is that it's a rule instead of a guidance that they've published right and and so that could, that is legitimately a difference it, it could have a real world impact especially in like civil litigation but you know when i look at it i just don't see a huge difference between what the atf has been saying for a long time and what they're saying now in this rule um now that doesn't mean that it's a like i said that's still seems like they're implying that people ought to get licenses and they're casting the shadow over used gun sales because, uh, well, you know, maybe you're a gun dealer, you know, it's all, it's very, <laughs> they do this all the time, right? They do this with any guns. They won't tell you if it's, they won't give you a blanket determination if something is legal or, or illegal. They'll say, oh, well, it depends on all the circumstances involved. Uh, give you some list of factors that have subjective parts in them and uh, you got to figure it out for yourself. And so the, uh, that is something where they're clearly trying to push people into, to uh, get FFLs 
because they're putting this again, a dark cloud over the whole situation. That's how, that's what they're, that's how I read it. That's what I think they're trying to do. It's a similar thing they do all the time, honestly. And a lot of federal agencies do this. And, um, you know, it, it creates a, a huge problem too. Uh, even if, even if there isn't a major change in what they're saying, the factors are, you still have this one, a big PR push. So a lot more people are going to be thinking about this when they perhaps go to sell their next used gun at a gun show or, or to a friend or whatever. And, um, you know, so that creates a lot of incentive to go and get an FFL. But the problem is that there was also, uh, an effort to make FFLs more difficult to get in the nineties under the Clinton administration. So now yeah. getting an FFL, <clears throat> right. Is, is a big task in and of itself, which puts people into a kind of a catch 22 situation, right? Yeah. That, that was the point I was going to make. It, it's funny to me that, you know, I, like you said, I think the, the open secret here is they're trying to push people towards thinking they need to get an FFL, but a long time bugaboo of the gun control movement is what they call like kitchen table gun dealers and that mm -hmm. sort of a thing where, where they're perturbed by people that have FFLs that aren't in like a brick and mortar storefront, for example. Right. Uh, so I don't know how you can hold those two things together where you're telling folks that want to sell maybe a couple private guns from the private collection per year or something that then need to go get an FFL, but you're also going to crack down on them because they're not a big time brick and mortar gun store. Uh, yeah. Sort of in conflict. So it, it really does create a conflict. I mean, look, the administration's goal and their stated goal is to try and eliminate any sales that don't involve a background check. And the problem is that they can't get universal background checks passed through Congress. And so they have to work with what the law is currently. And the law is set up to allow for private sales. That's what it's, that's how it's set up. It's intentionally done this way. People call these things loopholes or whatever. This is how the law is set up. It's supposed to be a regulation of commercial sales of firearms. And if you are not engaged in the business of dealing firearms, do not need to get a license. That's how it's always been. So, um, you know, they've the gun control advocates and and uh, Democratic administrations over the years have have fluctuated, like we just pointed out here, on whether there are too many people getting FFLs who don't actually have businesses in dealing firearms, and they're just trying to use because having a light federal license, yes, it means that when you sell a gun, you have to conduct a, an FBI background check, but it also gives you a bunch of other uh benefits basically you don't have to go through a background check you can have guns shipped to your uh your place of business which can also be your house um depending on the local zoning laws right and, and so back the kitchen table table dealer thing was like people were getting these licenses to make their lives a little easier if they wanted to buy and sell guns um you know even if it was mainly about the buying part right and and uh so the eighth the decision was made to make it harder to get the FFL and make those standards a bit tighter for, you know, the ATF will tell you in their guidances that if you, if you're just trying to get a license so that you can conduct background checks when you go to sell guns, but you're not actually trying to turn a profit and you're not actually in, you know, running a side business or main business, then uh, you can't get an FFL. They won't give you one. Um, and that, that of course comes along with the, what I mentioned before about the zoning problems. Like you need to have an actual, uh, address where you can, um, appropriately run a business to get an FFL. And so if you live in an apartment or something and they don't allow, or, or a house and they don't allow businesses there, well, you're out of luck for getting that FFL. But yeah, you know, I think the goal is to try and, either push people to get FFLs who can or push people to not do used gun sales at all. Right. Or, or to sell them through a licensed dealer on consignments or something like that. They're just trying to cast this cloud. So they want as many guns to put into the background check system as possible, as many sales. And, you know, maybe that's a laudable goal. Maybe people might agree with the, you know, universal background checks polls well, but it's not, doing it this way is, is not, a terribly workable way. And, and it hasn't worked in the past. The Obama administration, like I said, in 2016, they tried 
basically the same concept of using sort of scare tactics to to say, well, maybe what you're doing is illegal if you don't have a license. And so you might because the punishments are very severe, right? If you're selling guns without a license and you're supposed to have one, uh, you could go to prison for for years. Uh, you could have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. Uh, but there's actually fewer licensed dealers overall today than there were in 2016 or 2014. So, uh, you know, it, it didn't work back then. I don't, I don't know that it's going to make much difference today. You could see maybe there'll be more civil cases drawn from this. Maybe prosecutors will be more emboldened to take on some more of these cases with a, a federal rule instead of just ATF guidance. I'm a little skeptical that that's going to be the case. Um, that's really what it all comes down to. And the things that people complain about, like you, you read stories of, of dealers who are, who are just like, there are people who are basically acting as a gun dealer but not with a, without a license. And then they sell to people and they don't do any vetting of them and their guns end up in, in crimes. You know, there, there's plenty of stories you can look to. I mean, it's not, not a million. So I think generally speaking, uh, people who sell guns to criminals um, know that the person is, is a criminal. There's not always, there are examples where you can, you can find like the, the Midland shooter. I bought his gun from a, a uh, somebody, a private sale after being denied at a, a gun store. Um, you know, it, it happens. It's not something that is, uh, it doesn't happen at all or doesn't need to be addressed. It's just, you can look at, for instance, uh, University of Chicago does surveys of inmates who, uh, committed gun crimes and ask them where they get their firearms from. And yeah, a lot of them get their firearms from either straw purchases where the person is in on the whole thing throughout the purchase, right? They're, they're buying for somebody else who they know can't own guns or they're buying from people they know who, again, would very likely know that they're not allowed to actually own firearms. So uh, regardless, uh, th this sort of backdoor attempt at, at universal background checks one, I don't know that it's going to actually do a lot unless people start, unless prosecutors start taking up way more of these cases and judges side with this interpretation that the ATF has handed down. Um, uh, it start and start broadening out what the, from what the point that they already were. You know, a lot, a lot of these cases you can look back at, and there are examples of people being convicted 30, 40, 50 years ago on. Uh, dealing without a license and the money that was involved in how much they made was very little amount. Uh, the number of transactions were a few. It, it really does come down to the, the totality of the circumstances, but um, you know, none of these, none of these things seem that different from what's, what's been out there, what, what's in this rule uh, as far as I'm aware, at least. Yeah. And I think something that's telling is uh, after unveiling this big splashy, rollout of the new rule and how we're closing gun show loophole and stuff. Uh, President Biden closed with saying, but we also need to push for universal background checks. So to right. me, that's telling that they don't think this is going to move the needle all that much either. Uh, if he's right. still going to be calling for universal background checks. How do you close checks. the gun show loophole if you still need to have universal background checks? That's what universal background checks right. is. I mean, insofar as the gun show loophole is a thing, I mean, because the the problem with that term is that it's it misleads people into thinking that there's some special exception about gun shows and there just isn't. That it was no, the AG lied about this in his in his speech. He just straight up lied. So we're closing the gun show loophole under this regulation. Uh, it doesn't matter if you sell a gun at a gun store or online or in a brick and mortar store. Like it, the law is going to and it's like that's how the law works. It doesn't have anything to do with. Right location of sale that that's not what matters in whether or not somebody needs a license whether or not somebody is engaged in the business whether they are a commercial dealer of guns that's what matters whether they do it primarily to make a profit that is that is the predominantly to make a profit that's the standard now it has changed slightly because of the bipartisan safer communities act it, it used to there used to be a a livelihood standard in there as well it, it had to be part of your livelihood and that you had to make a profit. So they moved the livelihood aspect and now it's just predominantly for profit, which again, 
is vague, uh, but the law itself is fairly vague in that, on that point, and that's why. But, um, you know, it's also another reason why this, this rule might actually have a better chance of surviving legal challenges. That, that's another thing that making it a rule opens things up to, opens it up to maybe being taken a little more seriously in court, uh, especially in, perhaps in civil cases. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we'll, you'll see some difference there. You'll have more civil suits against uh, people who are dealing without a license, um, perhaps. But it also opens up the rule itself for more legal challenges, uh, which are probably going to come. But I will say that it's on firmer ground than many of the other previous Biden um, rules, because one, it doesn't really involve the ATF flip flopping. Like, like I'm saying here, like the, this is basically all the stuff they've been saying. They haven't really changed their tune on, on most of this stuff over the years. And the rule doesn't seem all that different from what they were saying back in 2016 or even before then. And um, additionally, it's connected to an actual change in law instituted by Congress, right? Uh, now, it's a pretty minor change as far as I can tell. And it's one that, at least according to uh, the, some of the Republican senators who voted for it, they, they think this rule oversteps what, they, what the language change means. But they're basically saying this just codifies what the courts had already been doing with the previous language, which is that they weren't relying on livelihood as part of the standard anyway. I don't know that's a good reason to change a law, but that is one of the reasons that they that they gave and basically saying this law, this language change kind of just recognizes the status quo as it already existed rather than makes any significant uh, reform. And so I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see what the courts do with this. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, like it doesn't close the gunshot loophole uh, because one, the gunshot loophole is kind of a questionable thing to begin with. It implies that where sale happens matters in any of this, and th which doesn't. But even if you're saying, well, private sales are what we're going to get at because they don't, a lot of, most states don't require you to uh, go through a background check to during a private sale between unlicensed individuals. Um, it doesn't close, you know, and a lot of those kind of sales happen at gun shows. I think that, you know, that's, that's certainly true, but um, this rule doesn't change anything about that. You can still have a private sale at a gun show, really the same circumstances from what the ATF was previously telling you. Mainly the, the main exceptions they offer, are like if you're trying to liquidate your collection or you're trying to sell guns to upgrade your personal collection, you know, occasionally, basically that's, you know, th those are some of the exceptions that, that they give you. That, that's, they, they want to make this distinction between people who are occasionally selling their personal collection um, from people who are repeatedly selling guns as a way to make money off of it uh, as a business. Right. And, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. I just think, um, at the end of the day, this isn't going to, uh, I'd be surprised if it, if it makes a lot of real world difference. Um, you know, the main reason that you don't see unlicensed dealers get prosecuted is because, frankly, it's not a very sexy federal prosecution. You know, it's not a big ticket kind of, especially if you can't prove that they're reliably, uh, you know, fueling crime, criminals with, with their, you know, private sales, right? Their unlicensed sales. So I just think that's a bigger, much bigger impediment to what they want to see, but, uh, but, you know, again, um, <laughs> I'm kind of, uh, the, you could tell that, uh, one, I was a bit of two minds on this and two, that I've been a bit like annoyed as well with some of the coverage I mean, Politico has been terrible. Um, you know, the, the way the administration talked about it, claiming that they're just lying about closing this loophole. And then, um, you know, they're just sort of, they just sort of buy that hook, line, and sinker without any questions. So you're just describing how the policy works incorrectly. And Politico is supposed to be a, a Washington-like policy paper. And they've gotten two major gun stories just completely wrong in recent weeks because they also got the... Uh, I remember they sent me scrambling because they claimed that there was a ghost gun ban included in the uh, one of the recent um, bills that, that Congress passed. And 
they just didn't understand what the policy actually was. It was, un, it was the Undetectable Firearms Act got renewed. Right. A relatively uncontroversial, although there is some opposition to it. I think GOA was opposed to renewal of this bill. Is essentially a bill that uh, outlaws guns that won't set off a metal detector. And it just makes you, it says that you have to have a certain amount of metal in your gun, basically. Um, stems from the 80s from really misnomer over how Glocks worked because Glocks had polymer frames. Right. But of course, they still had steel <laughs> slides and barrels uh but you know the plastic and the metal plastic bullets. gun yeah <laughs> right the whole plastic gun hysteria that's where the undetectable firearms that comes from but it's sort of this um it's it's not a top of mind policy i would say for most gun rights groups out there uh, it, like i said goa did express opposition to it but that got renewed and that's what they they didn't understand what it did and so they just misreported what it, what it was and never corrected it now they're doing the same thing with this, saying the gun show loophole is closed. Well, you, you could, hmm. one, you could, bottom line, you can still sell uh, a gun a, a gun through a private sale at a gun show if you want to under this. It, it doesn't make it illegal. Um, and honestly, like I just spent way too much time re <laughs> recounting here, it doesn't even really change what the factors are uh, for whether you need a license. Right. right. Let's move on to the next story. Yeah, I say, but the Biden administration got their their splashy headlines from it. They so sure, they surely did. <laughs> in an election year, mm -hmm. um, that's what they wanted. Heading, heading into our our final story, uh, this one comes out out of Tennessee, where we have a, a new bill, and it certainly looks like it's going to be a law fairly soon, uh, where lawmakers have passed a bill to basically make it mandatory in all public schools, both normal public schools and charter schools. That beginning in the 2025-2026 school year, they will have to begin teaching public school students age-appropriate slash grade-appropriate uh, gun safety lessons in their curriculum, annual curriculum. And it includes things like safe storage and what to do if you see a gun, to not handle a gun if you come across one, to notify an adult, that sort of a thing. Um, but that's a, a bill that has cleared the legislature. And, you know, I never heard back from uh, Governor Bill Lee's office, but I have to imagine he's going to sign this into law. There's no indication that he's against this. Uh, so it seems like this will be one of the first and most expansive mandatory school gun safety programs in the country. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's fascinating to see this happen. And honestly, a policy that I feel like should be relatively uncontroversial the way that it's written, the way that it, it's adopted. Cause I, it doesn't like teach firearms handling. It doesn't teach you. Right how to shoot guns. It's, there's no live fire. There are no actual guns involved in any of these, this curriculum. It's much closer to like the NRA's Eddie Eagle program, which is essentially just really for younger children uh, to try and teach them not to touch a firearm if they find one and they go and tell an adult, uh, which interestingly, you know, we had a podcast not that long ago where we talked to a researcher who did a study on the, that type of, gun safety education. Now they didn't use that at Eagle, but uh, it was the same basic principles involved in, in the, the, the training that the kids underwent and they found that it actually was effective. And so, you know, it doesn't seem like something that ought to be very controversial. Uh, certainly not in red States. And I would think even in other, you know, other States as well. Um, it doesn't have any of the hallmarks of a politically controversial piece of legislation. It doesn't teach them like that. The second amendment, you know, it doesn't give you, it doesn't teach them a specific political view of guns or anything like right. that. In fact, I think it explicitly forbids that you can't right. like the NRA is not going to be, they won't be able to use that Eagle cause you can't use um, any uh, like uh, coursework from a specific, uh yeah nothing branded no branded yeah affiliate. nothing branded right so yeah. you know no nra branded stuff so it's not gonna be at eagle it'll be some sort of state program presumably and um yeah i mean it just seems like a positive program that it's actually somewhat surprising you don't see that more um already throughout the country i mean there's a lot of we have a lot of firearms in the united states and um Actually, one of even if you don't own firearms, uh, you know your children. You should probably teach them some form of gun safety, because a lot of people do own firearms. And you know another thing that study found is that 
the children uh, of families that don't own firearms were actually much less likely to be afraid of the gun or to, to start to not to touch. They were much more likely to touch the gun um, in right. that, in that study, probably because they didn't have any, I, I think there's a, a common mistake where people think, well, we, I don't have, we don't have firearms, so I don't need to give gun safety training to my children because they're not going to come across a gun in my house. And that may be certainly true, but you know, the, you don't know every necessarily that every house, the friend's house they go to, uh, that somebody doesn't have firearm there. And so it's, I don't know, it just seems like a sensible, um, relatively uncontroversial uh, program that uh, um, it's almost kind of shocking that we don't have it uh, elsewhere to this point. And that Tennessee is kind of one of the first places to do this. Yeah, you've certainly seen the idea around there's a handful of states that have basically incentives for schools to do this or allow schools to do this. But Tennessee, mm. this one is the first I'm aware of that does like a statewide, you shall teach this every year once yeah. you come up with a curriculum, which is interesting to me. Um, mm. As far as opposition, I didn't see any of the major gun control groups come out against this. I actually reached out to every town. Um, they directed me to their Tennessee person, but ne that person never commented for me. So I don't know if they have a problem with this or not. But the fact that they're not making noise about it tells me it's it's not higher on their priority list to oppose yeah um, the only opposition so. i really saw was some parents uh were making a little bit of noise saying you know they're not necessarily against it in principle but they feel like it's the parent's job to teach this not the school yeah and there was a democrat the, right who who basically yeah. said as well that the responsibility should be on adults to like uh not on the children Right. Basically, yeah, it's adults job to keep their guns stored safely. So children never right. come across them, which, which is, is you know, fair enough, but true. Right. Yeah. But it, it doesn't really make sense to not teach gun safety to children be, just because of that, because we know that not every adult is responsible. That's the problem. Right. Right. Um, now, That's right. you know, we've, uh, accidental shootings, accidental shooting deaths are a small percentage of, of gun deaths, but you know, they're more than zero. So there's always room to improve you would think and um, you know, the pro a program like this especially the way they've set it up to be you know they, they seem to have gone out of their way to be as uncontroversial about it as they possibly could like there's other ways you could make this much more controversial like adding in live fire training or you know adding giving adding real guns to the mix or using nra branded materials or stuff like that even if that shouldn't be controversial and with Eddie eagle or something it, it certainly would be i think and so they're trying right. to find ways not to you know, they're trying to avoid some of those pitfalls and i think that it's a good idea and it's interesting to see hmm. yeah i think it makes an interesting test case for if this maybe will be an idea that spreads throughout the country so we'll yeah we'll be keeping yeah, absolutely keeping on top of it so you, you got any plans for the weekend anything interesting going on so yeah actually i think last podcast i teased that i was going to try to go take that friend that just got his first gun shooting um mm -hmm. and then colorado weather had other ideas in mind we actually had like sustained 100 mile an hour winds that knocked out power or like across yeah. broad parts of the state didn't you get uh, stuck like uh somewhere because of that yeah so i uh i went up to the mountains to go visit my fiance's uh, oh yeah update everyone i'm engaged oh yes congratulations <laughs> um, um but yeah i went up to there yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I went up to go have dinner, like a celebratory dinner, celebrating the engagement. And uh, suddenly the highways were shut down because uh, the 100 mile an hour winds mixed with snow. And it basically just created like a multi-day snow squall, I guess, uh -huh. in Colorado. So I was up, holed up in the mountains for a few days uh, and thus was not able to go do that range day. So I'm hoping that this weekend we can try to reschedule and make that happen. So long story go. short, I'm hoping to go shooting, taking my friend who got his first gun to go actually shoot it for the first time. So Nice. That's fun. Yeah. As uh, anyone watching can tell, I'm uh, not, not at home in Virginia. I'm up in Pennsylvania on the farm, my mom's horse farm, watching the farm uh, this weekend. So um, I'm a little tired because I have to, to get up early to do all the the farm work, but, um, you know, it, it's nice to be up in the country. Always enjoy coming up here. And, uh, so looking forward to the rest of my time here with the, with the animals and, and family, uh, visiting family and, and some friends coming by as well. So, uh, you know, ho hopefully that we have been having also crazy thunderstorms here. Um, so I'm hoping maybe they just are done 
for the rest of the weekend, but I'm not sure that's actually going to work out. We'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, of course, on the podcast this week, the the main podcast, the interview podcast, um, we, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we, we are, we're going to be talking a bit about the uh, firearms training program that I do for uh, interns at the National Journalism Center. So actually I have the head of the National Journalism Center uh, on the show with us, uh, T. Beckett Adams, also a prominent writer. Uh, he does uh, several columns for, for major outlets and uh, just a smart guy. Good, uh, good program they run over there. I've, I've used NJC interns. We've used them here at the reload. Um, it, Jake, Jake's worked with them and, and uh, it's been a, a really good experience every time I've had an NJC intern pretty much. Uh, so that the programs is, is a really good way for people to learn how to, you know, become a, a competent journalist. And I, I think one of the things you can do on that front is get as much uh, expertise and, and instruction in any topic you're going to be covering. And that rarely happens for firearms in our industry. So uh, this is, I think, one of the only programs that you'll see journalists go and do a actual uh, range day and classroom portion where we teach uh, sort of the basics of firearms uh, literacy and fire, you know, firearms policy and firearms function, all that stuff. And, and they actually shoot some guns, too. So, you know, check out that show when it comes out. Obviously, podcasts will be available for members on Sunday, so they'll get uh, early access to it as always. And then everybody else will be able to listen on Monday. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a good episode and I think you guys will enjoy that one as well. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, that's all we've got for this week's news update. Uh, we will see you guys again real soon. Of course, if you want to buy a membership, <laughs> I should mention that, right? If you want to buy a membership and support the reporting that we do and get early access to the podcast and get the opportunity to appear on the show and get, access to hundreds of pieces of analysis that you won't find anywhere else, uh, you can head over to reload.com and check out our membership options today. Uh, and of course, uh, if, if you're not ready to make the, the dive into membership, you can also help us by commenting and sharing this podcast or, or the other podcasts or any of our stories, you know, spreading the word about the reload. That always helps giving us a good rating, um, liking, sharing all that all these things are positive so uh that's another way you can help us out but we will see you guys again real soon